This call is now being streamed. Hello everyone, I'm finally able to join. This is Jignesh. Hello, Good morning. Good morning, hi. How are you everyone? Good morning. I'm fine. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Dr. Jignesh, good morning. Yeah, good morning, Ganesh. Thank you for joining. Sorry for the delay. That's all right. There is a problem in the connectivity. Good morning. So shall we start? It's already late. Yeah. Kantanara answer. Chakrari, sir, uh, you have to unmute yourself. Jiki, can you share your screen, please? Yeah, let me go ahead and do that. Thank uh -huh. 
Right, uh, let me just pull up my presentation. Ganesh, are you able to see the yeah, presentation? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Shantam Narayan, sir. Right, am I, uh, am I being heard clearly, Ganesh? Yeah. Okay, okay. when you want me to start. No, I won't. So let me introduce. Uh, good morning, one and all. Good morning uh, to all the faculty, students, and other staff members who are logged in. So I will I welcome you all for the first international webinar at our institution. So I would like to uh, introduce our uh, speaker, is uh, Dr. Jignesh Patel. He's a board certified cardiologist and interventional cardiologist of Stockton Cardiology Medical Group, California. He serves primarily at St. Joseph's Medical Center, Stockton. His primary area of expertise includes PCI, including treatment of complex bifurcation and left mile lesions, peripheral arterial interventions, trans catheter hydro valve replacements. He served as Chief Internal Resident, Chief Cardiology Fellow, and Chief International Cardiology Fellow at Memorates Medical Center, Brooklyn, New York, prior to joining this center. So his efforts to advance the science of cardiology has resulted in many original research articles, case reviews pub published in various prestigious peer-reviewed scientific journals. Dr. Patel's extensive clinical experience and medical knowledge spans both the western and eastern part of the world. So I would like to appreciate his passion towards the field of uh, cardiology, and I'd like to start this presentation. Thank you, Dr. Ragnitz Patel, for uh, accept accepting our uh, request, and uh, you can proceed. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh, Dr. Narayana. Thank you for inviting me for this uh, wonderful talk, and uh, I'm uh, hoping that you guys have a pretty uh, awesome day lined up in front of you as a part of the very hard day. All right, so without wasting any further time, let me just dive into the presentation for today. So we're going to talk about therapeutic advances in the management of mitral regurgitation. Now, it's a very important topic and a very important subject that a lot of times get ignored, gets ignored, unfortunately. Uh, so it's, it's certain, certain concepts are kind of important to understand. Uh, as every one of us know, mitral valve is one of the most complex valves. And uh, when we think of mitral valve, we just don't think of the valve lifters we have to think of the mitral valve as an entire apparatus. And this apparatus is very complex as it includes the leaflets, the commissures, the papillary muscles to which these leaflets are attached through cordic tendini, and the entire component of the apparatus, which also includes the left atrium and the left ventricular body. So the dysfunction in the valve can actually occur if any of this component is dysfunctional. And it's very essential to understand that. Now, just for because there are some medical students and some uh, young uh, uh, residents probably involved in this presentation, I thought that I would just browse through some basic of the mitral valve anatomy uh, before we proceed with the therapeutic options and other advances. So, when we talk about mitral valve, it's a bileaflet valve as we know, and the leaflets are pretty complex in its structure. They have right. So, there is an anterior leaflet. There is a posterior leaflet. Uh, structurally speaking, anterior leaflet occupies a bigger area compared to the posterior leaflet. And there are two views that is mentioned on the left side of the slide here. One is called surgeon's view, as if you are looking into your own mitral valve from the left atrium downwards. The way it looks is this way. Your aortic valve and the aorta sits in front of the valve, and the left atrial appendage is on anterolateral, anterolateral location. 
with that view in the perspective the mitral valve the anterior leaflet is divided in three scallops called a1 a2 and a3 and the posterior leaflet is divided in three scallops called p1 to p3 a1 and p1 are always closer to the left atrial appendage anterolateral and that's just one of the anatomical landmark to remember the orientation of the valve if a sonographer is looking at the valve say for example if you are doing a transthoracic echocardiogram and you are cutting the left ventricle in the short axis view and you are looking at this fish mouth structure called mitral valve in the short axis with the mid cavity level the leaflet there with the uh, the orientation will actually get flipped right so the left atrial appendage will be on this side which is on the right side and then aortic valve is always in the front and remember wherever there is an aortic valve the leaflet which is kind of tied up with the aortic valve has to be the anterior mitral valve leaflet and that is the thumb rule always remember that so again the orientation in that because we are looking from bottom now the a1 to a3 will be from left atrial appendage laterally to the medial and p1 to p3 will be this this orientation so on the right hand side of the screen is a tee picture is a three dimensional reconfigured picture of the mitral valve which we use very commonly in our practice when we are delineating the anatomy of the mitral valve and the regurgitation and so forth and so on and here as you can see this is if you imagine this this is a surgeon's view then this part will be your aortic valve the left atrial appendage will be sitting here and this is an anterolateral part so this is an anterior commissure this will be posterior commissure up here and then it, this is anterior mitral leaflet with three scallops and this is how you actually are able to look at the valve the three scallops are clearly visible they are a1 a2 a3 and same with the p1 p2 p3 now before we proceed it's important to understand how the mitral regurgitation is classified now this is a very very uh, standard kind of system of classification for mitral valve called carpentier system everyone is aware about this system and this system kind of defines the underlying functional pathophysiology of the mitral regurgitation and based on that it is divided in type 1 2 3a and 3b depending on what is the primary mechanism of the mitral regurgitation so it focuses on the mechanism right so the first uh, type in which the leaflet motion is normal leaflets in particular they have normal motion but there is secondary problem which is probably with the dilated left ventricle which also stretches the mitral valve annulus and the annulus gets stretched so even if even though the leaflets are moving normally they cannot coapt well and leave the scope for mitral regurgitation so dilated cardiomyopathy ischemic cardiomyopathy other other diseases like endocarditis well the valve get perforated so the normally moving leaflet but there is other problem so this is kind of like secondary mitral regurgitation for all practical purposes the second type where the leaflet motion is increased rather rather than normal it is increased <laughs> the come to our mind they are collapsed right so when the mitral valve scallops or the entire leaflet collapses and it has an ex 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 extremely large movements that would result in the mitral regurgitation so here the movements are at fault and this uh, common conditions causing this is usually degenerative disorders the common examples are marfan syndrome other fibroelastic deficiency balo disease is one of the common example and all those things even the trauma can cause it ehlers danlo syndrome other connective tissue diseases can cause it type 3a where the leaflet movements are restricted and that also is associated with restricted opening of the of the mitral orifice mitral valve orifice and that is seen in the rheumatic diseases typically which is more fulminant and common in uh, indian subcontinent type 3b is where the restricted leaflet motion is there but the closure is also restricted restricted and this is seen especially in some of the ischemic cardiomyopathy say for example there is an infralateral mi and with this inferior or uh, postro lateral uh, postro medial uh, 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 capillary muscle gets ischemic the leaflet's motion becomes very restricted the leaflet becomes tethered it doesn't move well it doesn't coapt well so that would leave the significant mitral regurgitation so that's also type of the secondary mitral regurgitation so again it's important to understand this concept of whether the mr is primary or secondary primary means the leaflet all the all the component of the valve apparatus are at fault and they are dysfunctional primarily that results in the mr while secondary is the the valve the valve itself which 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 includes the valve's leaflets are fine the leaflets are functioning fine but the other components of the apparatus which could be the lv cavity is is at fault say for example the classically it's a dilated cardiomyopathy it stretches the annulus and results in a secondary mr right so what determines the prognosis and the principle of management is probably this primary and secondary nature of the mr if it's a primary mr you have to understand that severity of the mr in in secondary is primarily dependent on the leaflet pathologies 
and it is secondarily uh, it relies on the uh, left and right ventricular function and pulmonary pressures while in case of secondary mitral regurgitation the primarily prognosis is dependent on the degree of underlying left ventricular function because that drives the mr to begin with and because of that the principal management strategy if the mr is primary where surgical repair and replacement is is the main way to go and mitra clip is one of the newer uh, modalities of dealing with the mr which we will discuss later in the talk is considered in those patients who have surgical prohibitive risk those patients who cannot be subjected to the surgery because of an extremely high surgical risk mitra clip is considered for that fda had approved that indication uh, actually a couple of years ago uh, while in case of secondary mitral regurgitation the focus is on goal directed medical treatment again because the lv cavity in most part is dysfunctional from the dilated cardiomyopathy process so good like and this is uh, this is let's pay our attention in this area which is kind of severe mr so severity of mr to define the severity of the mr uh, echocardiography and imaging is is the is one of the most important tools and the elements that we pay attention to is the vena contracta i think the easy way to remember is the way i have remembered this is 4567 so number 4567 just makes sense so four refers to basically the effective regurgitant orifice which is more than 0.4 cm square so when you look at the valve and the orifice which it leaves open because of the poor coaptation if it is more than 0.4 cm square that puts the mr in the severe category phi usually refers to the regurgitant fraction so it correlates with greater than 50% of regurgitant fraction six regurgitant volume of more than 60 ml per beat and seven is vena contracta which is the tightest part of the mitral regurgitant jet as it proceeds from the left ventricular cavity into the left atrium and where we measure the vena contracta perpendicular to the plane of the coaptation so that con vena contracta is if it's more than 0.7 cm that represents the uh, severe mr again hemodynamic consequences are important and it is important to understand this severe mr is causing what kind of defect in the, the lv right Uh, because that class classifies this uh, primary this severe mr into stage c1 and c2 c1 means the hemodynamic effects hasn't occurred yet to its full extent lv ef is still preserved with the severe mr ef is more than 60% and lv n systolic diameters are still less than 40 mm the lv cavity hasn't dilated yet fully even though the mr is severe and that's called stage c1 it's important to understand this because what the therapeutic options are driven by what what stage you are at primarily speaking C2 is a stage where the hemodynamic effects have occurred. LV has dilated. That would result into LV and systolic diameters of more than 40 millimeter, and your EF starts reducing less than 60 percent, right? And then the next stage, which is a stage D, is considered the severe. The uh, severity of MR is defined by the same criteria. What changes is the symptoms. Now, patient becomes symptomatic with decreased exercise tolerance and exertional exertional symptoms. Uh, so that puts the patient in the symptomatic uh, category. Again. there is a little difference when we talk about primary mr and secondary mr in terms of the criteria for severity and this is something important to understand because one of the studies the mitra fr study which looked into the mitra clip uh, some of the criteria is tied up with the study i will i will dive into that a little bit later when we talk about those studies so progressive mr again is patient has uh, not met with the severe uh, criteria uh, and then they are at risk because of the derangement in the mitral valve system uh symptomatic asymptomatic severe mr for secondary mr for say for example patient has dilated cardiomyopathy ischemic cardiomyopathy and then mr ensues not primarily because of the leaflet problem uh, but because of the lv cavity and the annulus problems in that case uh the severity is defined by effective regurgitant orifice of more than 0.2 cm square so 20 mm or more right while for the primary mr it was 0.4 cm square regurgitant volume is more than 30 ml while for primary it was more than 60 ml the regurgitant fraction still remains the same which is more than 50% and again this defines the severity for secondary mr and then uh, the patient can be say asarios the hemodynamic consequences are kind of important because primarily the dysfunctional lv is is a, is the culprit so your lv function is going to be affected in both the scenarios unlike the primary mr now how do we manage this patient so 2020 acc aha came up with the new a little bit of updated uh, valve management guidelines uh, the prior valve uh, valvular heart disease management guidelines from uh, were from 2014 and uh, they were used uh, uh, extensively in clinical practice 2020 acc aha released the new guidelines for the mitral valve regurgitation and management and they had find a little bit of changes compared to uh, the prior guidelines so a few changes that i would like to uh, pay our attention to is in case where the mr is primary again leaflet problems 
and it is severe by the criteria that we discussed already, irrespective of patient has uh, it, uh, suffered the hemodynamic, hemodynamic consequences or not, if the patient is symptomatic with severe MR, remember, very simple, patient is symptomatic from severe MR, then you go for surgery. That's it. You just offer those patients mitral valve surgery, and that is class one indication, right? And again, if, if the hemodynamic consequences are present, where uh, it doesn't matter. Patient is symptomatic, you proceed with the surgery. Uh, if these patients who are ideally candidate for mitral valve surgery, if they are high risk patients, so high that they are prohibitive for surgery, then and their anatomy is favorable for transcatheter approach, then they become candidate for what is called as T transcatheter edge to edge mitral valve repair. So it's called TER, T E E R, and it's also referred sometimes as TAMBER or transcatheter mitral valve repair. So those are the transcatheter approaches to repair the mitral valves, uh, where the surgery is not feasible because of the high surgical risk of the patient. Now, again, in this, when you talk about mitral valve surgery, you think of two options, whether it's a mitral valve replacement or it's a mitral valve repair techniques, right? So if the patient has rheumatic mitral valve disease, uh, mitral valve repairs are somehow more preferred compared to the mitral valve surgery because the apparatus is very calcified and, and they may not be suitable for surgical dissection and surgical replacement. In that case, mitral valve repair is probably a better option compared to surgery. It receives class 2B indication. If there is a degenerative disease involved as an underlying pathophysiologic mechanism, uh, replacement could be the primary way of surgery. Again, other surgical repairs could be also considered depending on the anatomies there. Versus the secondary MR situation uh, where, as I mentioned, the goal-directed medical therapy is the cornerstone of the treatment. In that, there is a, the one update in these guidelines that I wanted to uh, pay attention, uh, wanted you to pay attention, is this area, which is secondary MR or functional, where patient has severe MR. Uh, and again, if the patient's LV function is affected and it's reduced and it's less than 50% and patient remains persistently symptomatic in spite of goal-directed medical therapy, then transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge mitral valve repair receives a two-way indication. Now, this is a newly added indication for MitraClip. MitraClip is one of the uh, FDA-approved devices, which is used in, uh, which is used uh, like in last several years, since 2018, uh, when the COAP study came out. Since then, it has its use has picked up. Initially, it was only used for primary MR, where it was surgically prohibitive patient. Now, the, F, uh, the, the ACCHA guidelines approve it and give it a two-way indication in an appropriate category of patients with LVEF reduced to less than 50%, patient remaining symptomatic on goal-directed medical therapy, and certain criteria of hemodynamics are met, then patient can be treated with mitraclip in that situation uh, with the class 2 indication. This is just a summary of what we talked. I'm not going to repeat it. So just let's try to kind of uh, summarize this concept of mitral regurgitation. It's not a single disease entity. All the components that we discussed uh, play a role. Uh, which includes the left atrium, left ventricle, and the entire uh, uh, different components of the apparatus. So this is just the same thing that we discussed. So um, uh, again, multiple mechanisms are responsible for the functional MR or secondary MR. Uh, the importance is when the LV and, uh, and diastolic diameter actually extends below 65 millimeter, this is like a known number. That's when the mitral valve annulus starts getting stretched to the point that the leaflet cannot coap well, the coaptation zone is disturbed, and that would lead to the mitral regurgitation in the cases of functional mitral regurgitation. Posterior leaflet angle of greater than 45, 45 degrees. This is one of the important elements, and this is especially relevant in the ischemic MR, where patient has old hill posterolateral MI, and the posteromedial um, uh, papillary muscle is ischemic and dysfunctional, and that leads to tethered posterior leaflet and then the angle of the posterior leaflet is more than 45 degree from the coaptation zone that leads to the uh, uh, that can lead to the functional MR and again uh, with the valves not coming all the way up to the closure line it if it if it leaves the coaptation depth of more than 11 millimeter uh, again that would be responsible uh, for the uh, secondary or the functional MR uh, in, in those situations. Um, again, these are some guidelines that we already discussed. So what are the most, most common surgical options uh, that we talk about? So when we talk about surgical options, uh, we think of um, Alferi suture, which, is, which makes the mitral valve a figure of eight configuration and leaves a dual orifice. That's a classic suture, uh, classic repair procedure, which has been offered for many years. Uh, leaflet resection, the redundant areas or the, the scallops which are prolapsing because of the redundant tissue can be resected and that uh, leaflet can be repaired surgically. Uh, the most common surgical repair procedure uh, nowadays in the United States is still annuloplasty. So it's a downsizing annuloplasty, 
and basically there is an annular ring that the surgeon sews into the mitral valve annulus and it, it tightens the annulus and that's why it's called downsizing annuloplasty and that achieves the um, that addresses the underlying pathophysiologic mechanism for the secondary MR, which is a stretch on the annulus. Again, caudal repair in cases of the uh, caudal rupture or flail leaflets can be considered as well. Now, these three elements, which is the alfieri suture, uh, ring annuloplasty and caudal repair. So a lot of techniques are looking into achieving this uh, surgical repair procedures by transcatheter means. And that's where the newer technologies come in picture. And they can be potentially replicated by transcatheter approach. And again, no one approach would be ideal and it would be one size fit all approach. Every patient has their own unique anatomy and uh, trans thoracic and trans esophageal echocardiogram, as I mentioned earlier, they are the cornerstone of deciding what therapy would be right for your patient because underlying uh, mechanism needs to be elucidated as best as possible uh, to achieve the therapeutic success. This is just a slide and a schematic to show how the surgical uh, ring is sewed into the mitral valve annulus. It, it's, it requires some complex suturing and uh, they have like uh, basically the size selection and everything uh, is, is, should be appropriate and it's, it downsizes the annulus. It just kind of uh, restricts the annulus and then that's why it addresses the underlying pathophysiologic mechanism. This is just to show, this schematic just shows what the repair, what the resection, repair and uh, annuloplasty uh, combined together in the surgical field would look like. So the example is here, there is a little bit of P2 prolapse. This is a posterior leaflet and a P2 scallop. So the, uh, this kind of schematic shows a P2 prolapse here as an etiology for, or a rather a mechanism for the mitral regurgitation. So the surgeon goes, puts a V-shaped V, v uh, resection, cuts off the extra tissue, sutures it, repairs the leaflet and scallop, and then puts the annuloplasty ring here. Obviously it shows the significantly bulky and uh, redundant tissue of the P2, which is most commonly affected scallop for most uh, of the functional MR, I mean, primary MR patients. And again, the, the surgeon uh, entire uh, area of the affected leaflet and sutures and annuloplasty ring is made. Uh, this is an isolated uh, um, anterior leaflet situation in surgical repair sutures are placed and annuloplasty ring is placed. So basically re resection, repair and downsizing annuloplasty. So these are, these are the way of approaching uh, the mitral valve uh, regurgitation in the surgical uh, field. So it's mitral repair versus replacement uh, for severe ischemic MR. What is better, what is not? So again, as I said, there is uh, typically if the institution has a very good experience with the surgical repairs, um, uh, the general consensus is a repair procedure in the suitable patient uh, at an expert surgical center would achieve reasonably better, uh, reasonably good result, sometimes even better than the mitral valve replacement, and that's why it's a preferred approach. Um, and this slide just uh, represents a recently performed study where the primary composite endpoint included death, stroke, and subsequent mitral valve surgery in hospitalization and hospitalization for heart failure. Uh, along with the symptoms of NYHA class 1 or more in patients who received mitral valve repair versus replacement. They were, it was a randomized study and they just uh, uh, followed this patient for one year. As you can see here, uh, it did not achieve any uh, statistical significance in this study in the composite cardiac endpoints and death uh, looked at separately. But uh, just looking at the kaplan mirror curves, it looks like enjoys lower rate of death and mortality uh, compared to the mitral valve replacement. Uh, but just the point I'm trying to make it make here is with adequate surgical expertise uh, with mitral valve repair, uh, it can be a preferred procedure. Uh, again, this shows just a two-year outcome of surgical treatment of severe ischemic MR, a repair versus replacement compared. And recurrent MR is one of the bigger problems in the repair situations. Uh, repairs typically as the time advances because underlying problem is the LV which the tendency of that LV would, would be to continue to the, continuously dilate as the pathology progresses. And that would put an extra stretch on the, stretch on the uh, annulus and will keep on uh, causing the recurrent MR and further need for surgical valve replacements in future compared to the replacement up front. Uh, again, as I said, the death uh, showed the, 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 that the overall number of deaths might be somewhat lower compared to replacement because it is less of an extensive surgery, uh, if, if you say so. So what about the transcatheter options, right? Because that's what I'm going to uh, talk a little bit more um, to, in, in today's presentation. Uh, so basic premise for transcatheter valve therapy, where does, it, where does it lie? I showed in a slide earlier that some of the mechanisms for the surgical repair can be replicated through transcatheter trans mechanisms. And that's where a lot of newer techniques are coming in play. 
So transcatheter devices try to uh, establish those surgical therapies which are mounted on catheter. Uh, therapy should demonstrate the benefit when compared with the gold standard established therapy, which is typically the surgery. Uh, and this busy slide, this slide looks pretty busy, but this is just to kind of show where the landscape uh, as of 2018 in this field of achieving the transcatheter mitral valve repair is expanding. So many companies and so many uh, uh, like scientific studies are looking into different way of approaching mitral valve anatomy through transcatheter devices and systems. So there are zillions of systems available for surgical repair, for transcatheter surgical repair, I mean, transcatheter repairs and transcatheter edge to edge fixation. Mitra clip is the only one uh, which has basically FD approved and it is, uh, it is, it is FD approved uh, therapy so far. Uh, in terms of transcatheter repair systems. Uh, there are a lot of other systems. I'm not going to go into the details of that. Uh, this is just to show that there is a whole, whole um, uh, horizon which is ready to be expanded uh, in this field of transcatheter mitral valve repairs. So uh, what laid the foundation of, uh, of uh, my transcatheter mitral valve repair systems? So in 2018 TCT, two studies were presented uh, well, the co-op study was presented, but just prior to that, another study called MITRA FR had came into, uh, was published in the New York Journal of Medicine. And these two studies kind of laid the foundation. Uh, so the co trial basically uh, looked in, it is a parallelly, it is a, it is a multi-central randomized controlled trial. It was an open label trial, uh, which enrolled about 610 patients with heart failure. All of those patients had moderate to severe, which is which means it was three plus or four plus secondary MR. So all those MRs were functional MR. Etiologically, none of them were primary MR. We are talking about secondary MR who remained symptomatic despite of maximally tolerated goal directed medical therapy. So these patients were all put on goal directed medical therapy. They were followed for a certain amount of time, um, and after uh, after they tolerated it and after the the GDMT was instituted. That's when they were randomized into either mitra clip plus continuation of GDMT arm and GDMT alone. So 305 patients on each side. Uh, this is just the rough study flow. Again, about 300 patients, you can say, on both the sides on goal directed therapy alone versus goal directed therapy and mitra clip. So, what were the primary endpoints? The primary endpoints of the COAP were uh, focusing on all hospitalizations for heart failure within 24 months, which is two years of follow up after mitra clip. A placement. So what they noticed was after the time of randomization, when these patients were followed for about two years, there was significant difference in the Kaplan Merkows separated right from the beginning and they continued to separate and they remained uh, that way at the two years of follow up with significant reduction in the heart failure hospitalizations from the mitral regurgitation in those patients who had received the therapy as well as the mitral and the, statistically, there were significant uh, there was significant difference. Uh, they also looked into all cause mortality, which was one of their secondary endpoints. Uh, but this was very exciting when the trial was presented in 2018. Actually, I was there in the TCT um, when Dr. Gregstone was presenting, and uh, there was the whole uh, auditorium like kind of clapped and applauded because this was something very new and groundbreaking for the in the in the in the realm of mitral replacement. Uh, mitral valve therapies. So anyways, the all-cause all mortality was significantly low in, in the arm of uh, uh, transcatheter therapeutics. And at two years of follow-up, the uh, mortality was uh, kind of significant. Again, there was statistical significance achieved here. Number needed to treat uh, to save one life was pretty close to six, which is very small number, technically speaking. Um, and death or heart failure hospitalization combined was again one of their secondary endpoints. And when for two years, Again, there was significant statistical difference and uh, number needed to treat to uh, kind of avoid this complication together was close to 4.5 uh, in my drug clip. Uh, so this is just to all this, all the slides kind of put together. So again, my drug clip kind of showed significant improvement in heart failure related. See here, this slide kind of caught my attention because as you can see that these patients uh, were uh, both, both the groups were randomized. Uh, so the, the, there was a central body which will govern the criteria for randomization. So there, the baseline, as, as you can see here, this is plus three and plus four MR. So at baseline, patients had severe secondary or functional MR on both the groups. And after mitra clip, right within first 30 days, most of the severe MR had reduced significantly. And those three plus and four plus MR had converted into less than one plus or less than or equal to one and two plus MR. And it maintained that ratio as the time proceeded for pretty much two years of the time uh, for which the patients were followed up. So at two years of follow-up, it continued to, the severe MR continued to decrease 
and almost 99% of post mitral clip patients had mitral regurgitation of only less than or equal compared to gold directed medical therapy you can see here these gray bars are still hanging uh, hovering over which is 3 plus and 4 plus mr and that would contribute to their mortality or heart failure readmissions obviously so again uh, now in 2019 at uh, tct they presented a three year follow up on the coap trial and this is uh, this is something important to understand that at two years we had two years of follow up now we have three years of follow up so we have now some robust follow up in the in the realm of mitral clip uh, uh, transcatheter treatment and at three year follow up the initial advantages that we saw at two year kind of continued and that's very important to notice that so number needed to treat to prevent one death is still close to 8 which is still a very good number and 33% relative risk reduction in mortality at 3 years of follow up and again a uh, re reduction in the hospitalization at 3 year is still statistically significant look at the statistical value here so it still remains statistically significant so in the mitra clip arm even at 3 years of follow up there is significant risk reduction 51% relative risk reduction in heart failure hospitalization so now it is proven that in an appropriately selected candidate uh, if the mitra clip is done uh, at, at a well at a center which is well trained and they have enough expertise along with continuation of the gold directed medical therapy those patients significantly do better not only in terms of their mortality but also in terms of their heart failure uh, profile and their symptomatic improvement and uh, staying away from the hospital there was very important concept that we learned by failure of the mitra fr i mentioned earlier that the mitra fr was a european uh, fr french trial which uh, which was uh, started in france and uh, that just came out a few months before the coap trial but that trial had negative results it did not show the significant improvement in in the arms of patients uh, in the in the arm where patients were treated with mitra clip and gold directed medical therapy and uh, as you can see here the p values did not meet significance in the mitra clip plus medical treatment arm Com when compared with the medical treatment alone and uh, that was a bit discouraging at that time uh, until the coap came but what this trial did is actually it explained us how to select the right patient because the failure of the trial was not because the therapy was inadequate or mitral clip was not uh, helpful it was just that the criteria by which they selected their patients to enroll in the trial may not be most optimal and just to kind of see that uh, like point out that sala and difference here uh the inclusion criteria as you can see the mitra fr enrolled patients with little bit of lower uh, ejection fraction compared to the coap trial the significance here was they did not really define any lv and uh, systolic diameters as their cutoff for inclusion while the cutoff for coap inclusion criteria was lv and systolic diameters of less than or equal to 70 mm what this means is if your lv cavity is significantly dilated beyond 7 cm then they were not the candidates to receive the mitral uh, mitra clip even though, even if they had severe mr and persistent symptoms because uh, uh, the researchers thought that at that point the damage is done damage is done too too beyond to uh, control and tackle and mitra clip will not help so those patients were excluded actually also the definition of the severe mr was also different um, uh, remember i mentioned earlier in one of the slides where the severity of the secondary mr Uh, is defined as an effective regurgitant orifice area of more than point uh, more than 20 mm more than 20 mm square in for functional fr uh, pay of uh, mr patient so mitral fr uh, remain uh, included those patients who had severe uh, mitral regurgitation by that criteria and ero of greater than 20 mm were included uh, with the regurgitant volume of greater than 30 ml while in the coap they went ahead and they selected more severe mr in terms of the effective regurgitant orifice area and their uh, regurgitant volumes so in in the coap trial they kind of their cutoff was erof more than 30 mm so anything less than 30 mm in terms of the regurgitant orifice area they were not included in the study so essentially between the lv and systolic diameters and the effective regurgitant uh, orifice area what was the primary difference between mitra fr and coap trial it was coap trial selected patients with rather larger regurgitant orifice and relatively smaller lv cavities so they were in the more ideal kind of shape where they into perspective with one snapshot uh, as you can see here the lv and diastolic volume is on the x axis and the effective regurgitant orifice area is on the on on the y axis here and for the coap this is this is where the patients in the coap studies were so the patients had rather more severe or rather larger mr orifice but relatively uh, relatively preserved hemodynamics of the left ventricular cavity the cavities were still smaller while in mitra fr the cavities have gone bigger and at a uh, where the regurgitation orifice was still smaller
So that's why these patients did not benefit, these patients did. Um, anyways, so many of these heart failure patients would have secondary MR. One out of five heart failure patients actually uh, develop secondary MR, so we should just be uh, aware about it. Um, again, mm -hmm. heart failure patients uh, should be looked into the symptoms. Um, MR severity predicts progressively worse prognosis for heart failure patients. So this, this is something that we need to remember. Uh, it should not be ignored. It is an ignored territory for a lot, uh, for, for a lot of times. It is not paid attention to the, the, uh, the, uh, the consecutive mitral regurgitation, which is, uh, which is, which happens with the heart failure. So along with optimization of heart failure medication, everything else we do, including resynchronization, Paying attention to what is happening to the mitral regurgitation is important because it is tied up with increased mortality in those patients. Uh, so again, uh, this is after the 2020 ACC AHA guidelines update where transcatheter edge to edge repair or T approved indication. Um, so again, uh, most important thing is choosing the patients wisely uh, to get the maximum benefit out of the mitral clip therapy. Uh, if the MR is greater than or equal to three uh, by AAC echocardiographic criteria, uh, left ventricular ejection fraction has to be paid attention to. Your EF should be less than 50%. Uh, again, left ventricular and systolic diameters uh, should be less than 70 millimeters, so less than 7 centimeter cavity uh, at the end systole. And symptoms and MR severity which persists despite of goal directed medical treatment. Again, these are different, uh, just this graph just shows a different variety of modalities of treatment, uh, including the ICDs and CRTs to treat our heart failure patients. But if there is an existing mitral regurgitation, uh, if mitral clip is applied in the right uh, selection uh, of patients, it achieves the uh, uh, highest decrease in the mortality. Uh, so again, let's just focus on what is mitral clip. I'm going to present a case quickly. Uh, so mitral clip is a uh, minimally invasive beating heart procedure. No cardiopulmonary bypass is required. It's all catheter based. It allows a real time mitral uh, regurgitation assessment because um, the intra, uh, intra procedural TE is monitoring what's happening to the mitral regurgitation. So a real time hemodynamic assessment is obtained. Um, and I'm just going to play this uh, video quickly. The heart is one of the most important organs in the body, working relentlessly to enable the human cardiovascular system to function. The heart has four chambers, the upper right and left atria, and the lower left and right ventricles. In a healthy heart, blood flows in one direction through the heart's chambers. Delicate tissue-like structures called valves function to ensure unidirectional blood flow within. The heart has four such valves, which regulate direction of the blood flow. The mitral valve separates the left atrium from the left ventricle and is made up of two thin flexible flaps called leaflets. When freshly oxygenated blood from the lungs returns to the heart, it enters the heart through the left atrium. Left atrium relaxation causes the mitral valve to open, enabling blood to travel into the left ventricle. When the left ventricle contracts, the mitral valve closes to prevent backflow. In some people, the mitral valve doesn't close tightly causing mitral valve regurgitation. When the heart beats during contraction, the blood from the left ventricle can flow back up to the left atrium. Mitral regurgitation, MR, can be subdivided into functional and degenerative subtypes. Degenerative MR, or primary, results from anatomical abnormalities of the valve itself. In most cases, the cordy connecting the mitral valve to the papillary muscle rupture or elongate, causing leaflet prolapse. MR is a progressive disease which, if left untreated, can initiate a series of events culminating in heart failure and death. Current guidelines recommend surgical mitral valve repair or replacement in severe MR patients. For MR patients for whom surgery is not an option, minimally invasive procedures are available. MitraClip is a unique, highly maneuverable transcatheter system for mitral valve repair. This procedure avoids cardiopulmonary bypass using minimally invasive venous approach. And transeptal puncture to gain access to the left atrium. MitraClip's steerable guide catheter is introduced over a previously placed guide wire. The dilator is used to gradually advance the guide into the left atrium, and the guide wire and dilator removed. The clip delivery system is advanced into the left atrium, positioning the clip above the regurgitant jet 
and perpendicular to the mitral valve plane. Inside the left atrium, the clip arms are open to 180 degrees and positioned perpendicular to the line of coaptation before crossing into the left ventricle. The clip is advanced into the left ventricle below the valve leaflets and retracted to grasp the leaflets. Mitra clip grippers are designed to drop firmly into the clip arms, securely capturing both leaflets. Once the arms are closed, they create a double orifice within the mitral valve. Prior to clip deployment, echocardiographic imaging is used to assess procedural efficiency and leaflet capture. Prior to deployment, the mitral clip can be released and repositioned for optimal MR reduction. Once achieved, the clip is released and the full system retracted. In most cases, the transeptal puncture reseals itself and tissue ingrowth between the clip arms increases, facilitated by the polyester clip covering, which promotes healing to create a fibrous tissue bridge between the leaflets. The mitra clip procedure is a minimally invasive, highly effective treatment option for select patients. So this was just to kind of show the uh, uh, delivery system and how it how it functions and how we grasp the leaflets in the mitral uh, in the mitra clip and. Uh, which is introduced perpendicular to the coaptation line and that reduces the mitral regurgitation. So again, the important components of delivery includes the transeptal uh, crossing and guiding system and puncturing the uh, atrial septum, entering from the right atrium to the left atrium. Again, entering at the correct point uh, is very important so that the device system could be steered towards the uh, mitral um, uh, regurgitant to mitral wall in a perpendicular fashion leaflet grasp and final deployment of the device and uh, real-time hemodynamic assessment is done. So current mitra clip system is called as a generation 4 system. It's called G4 system. There are four different clips which are available uh, in the market currently. Um, both the varieties of the leaf, uh, leaf, uh, uh, clips are called NT and XT versions. Uh, basically, they refer to the leaflet, uh, their, uh, their clip length. So the NT clips are 9 millimeter long while the XT clips are 12 millimeter long depending on the uh, how is the mitral uh, leaflet uh, which is uh, which is uh, which is affected you can select either an anti clip or the xt clip and both those variety of the clips are available in two different thickness which is four millimeter thick and uh, six millimeter thick so one is a normal version one is a wider version uh, and again uh, they can be picked according to the uh, uh, particular anatomy so let me just uh, kind of briefly show you a case which this was done at the University of Washington. Again, uh, this kind of like uh, shows the importance of uh, intraprocedural transesophageal leaflet first. Uh, when the leaflet is gripped, what's going to happen? There is going to be a lot of tension. And with that lot of tension on this, um, on this, uh, on this anterior leaflet, the perpendicular orientation of your uh, uh, mitra clip device is invariably going to change. So at this time, the echocardiography and other planimetry views are very important to obtain to kind of reorient your mitra clip in the perpendicular direction. And so that uh, the posterior leaflet is grabbed in that perpendicular direction. Maintaining the, maintaining the grasp in the perpendicular direction to the coaptation line is, is one of the most important thing in terms of the placement. Um, again, this slide just shows that at this time, uh, this, there is a comprehensive baseline TE exam done before the uh, mitra clip was placed. And as you can see, this is a wide based MR jet. This is a surgeon's view. You're looking from the left atrium perspective and look how big is this uh, wide MR. Uh, this is your anterior leaflet, which is prolapsing, leading to the posteriorly directed jet. Uh, this is looking from the left ventricular perspective and uh, looking at the left ventricle basically helps us uh, capture the vena contracta because the vena contracta occurs in the left ventricular side. So you capture the vena contracta here to understand the severity of the MR. Again, some further assessment um, of, the, of the MR. And as you can see here, uh, by calculating this vena contracta from the left ventricular side, in this patient, the vena contracta was 1.1 centimeter. Uh, so that's a pretty big vena contracta. More than, seven, more than 0.7 centimeter square is considered severe MR. So this is uh, definitely a severe MR case because of the anterior leaflet prolapse. As you can see here, the anterior leaflet is redundant and is prolapsing in the cavity of the left atrium. Uh, all right, some uh, hemodynamic calculations resulted into the ERO of 0.46 centimeters square, uh, and also the findings of the pulmonary vein flows on the on the uh, on the on the echocardiogram were suggestive of the severity of the MR. Again, this was this number, as I mentioned in the QAP trial, 
uh, one of the exclusion criteria was the EROA of less than uh, 0.30. So here it is a significantly larger uh, orifice area of more than uh, 0.4 centimeters square. Uh, procedural guidance. So again, this is extremely important to provide all these uh, 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 planimetry views to place the uh, place the mitra clip device in the best position to get the best results. And that's where the intra procedural trans esophageal echocardiogram. Um, is, is extremely important. The more than one clip is placed, you do not artificially narrow the mitral valve orifice too much because then otherwise it will create mitral stenosis situation, uh, increasing the trans uh, uh, valvular gradient, and that would be no good either. So basically, under the TE guidance, again, uh, the second clip, uh, second uh, mitral clip was placed. As you can see here, there is already one clip is in the place, and the second clip is being placed. Uh, again, another figure of second clip uh, placed adjacent to the first clip. Uh, now both the clips are in the place and that reduces the, the, the prolapse. So remember in the picture, previous picture, there was a significant A2 prolapse. So that prolapse has actually halted because that prolapse is now, the prolapse lift rate is now gripped with the second clip. So final results after the XTW and NT Mitra clips uh, were deployed. And you can see here, this is a final result. Uh, again, uh, the two very tiny small MR jets are uh, visible here, but they are very mild MR. As you can see from the ventricular side, again, look at the vena contractor size. There are barely any vena contractor that you can see here. So very tiny vena contractor left. There is a reversal of the, or rather the normalization of the pulmonary vein flow in the left and upper, uh, right upper pulmonary veins, uh, which would kind of suggest that the, there is no severe mitral regurgitation uh, left along with other uh, parameters. And this is just the comparison of the baseline 3D uh, picture with the wide based MR jet with a huge uh, prolapse of the anterior leaflet. And this is after placement of two mitra clips uh, remaining, which is leaving behind like very small uh, regurgitant um, uh, areas. Uh, and again, uh, the transvalvular gradient was also measured, which was only two millimeter of mercury. So this was, this did not induce a severe uh, transvalvular gradient causing mitral stenosis as well. So summary of this case is a successful procedure of using two generation four mitra clips. One was XTW, one was NT to treat the anterior leaflet prolapse in a patient who had surgically prohibitive risk. Uh, and that resulted in a great reduction of the MR, normalized pulmonary venous flow. Remaining MR was just mild at the best and low inflow gradients across the mitral wall of two millimeters of mercury. So what are the, what are some of the important challenges? Anatomical challenges are the biggest challenges. Uh, again, if the leaflets are calcified, the collapse, it makes it very difficult to place this device. Uh, small uh, valve areas to begin with, there is a risk of mitral stenosis and uh, inducing an artificial mitral stenosis to treat the mitral regurgitation doesn't make any sense. Uh, tethered uh, uh, and uh, very functionally restricted uh, leaflets also causes a problem because grasping those things worth of data, we do not know how durable this device is in long run, in five years, 10 years time. I don't know uh, how the results would pan out to be. People would be looking into it. There are some other device uh, systems. So uh, many other companies are coming with their own kind of uh, system. So Edwards has come out with the Pascal system. Uh, I like this name. It kind of refers to paddles, spacer, claspers, and Alfieri as a short form. Uh, it has the spacer and paddles essentially and concept wise, it's pretty much the uh, same concept of the mitra clip, except the design is a little different. Uh, the spacer is placed between um, the regurgitant leaflets and uh, the paddles will clasp uh, and grasp those leaflets together. And again, it is done through transfemoral and transseptal approach with a different Edwards delivery device system. Uh, there are a few cases which are already being done uh, and further trials are needed. Uh, trans catheter mitral therapies, including aneuroplasty, there are different devices which are being examined. Cardio band is one of them. Again, this is developed uh, by Valtec in um, concert with Edwards. And this cardio band is also a trans catheter mounted system. You can suture up and you can put this band around the mitral valve aneurys. Uh, as it is shown in this picture to kind of narrow the annular size and this is all trans catheter so you do not require the surgical repair for that uh, BSC milliped is another system it also has it has eight anchors compared to 15 to 18 anchors which are uh, which kind of uh, achieves a better surgical uh, uh, correction of the mitral valve annulus compared to that uh, in the milliped system there are eight anchors uh, it is a semi-rigid uh, complete ring uh, and there is an adjustable clinching for it uh, and it is integrated with the uh, intracardiac echocardiogram and ice imaging. Uh, trans standard alone therapy might be questionable uh, and um, ice or intracardiac, intracardiac echocardiogram uh, would be needed. So uh, just to summarize some of the tools are needed, 
uh, real time imaging is very important without that good results cannot be achieved as i stressed earlier uh, variable etiologies may make it difficult calcification makes it difficult appropriate sizing the process uh, process is sometimes uh, if the devices are too big or multiple uh, multiple clips are required it can also create uh, uh, obstruction in the lvot and uh, can cause problems uh, and currently the systems are uh, still pretty large uh, and there is definitely some thrombotic risk involved uh, with this device system so with this slide i will conclude thank you all for paying attention and listening to the presentation thank you thank you very much dr narayan uh, yeah thanks uh, dr jignesh for your very well elaborate and wonderful presentation I just wanted to know uh, how the uh, transcathetic therapeutics in the area of uh, valvular uh, diseases is progressing across the world. And uh, uh, in our country also, uh, uh, in the majority of metro cities, Mitra Clip has uh, taken, uh, so brought its uh, footstep and uh, there are uh, quite a few centers who have uh, done a significant number of Mitra Clips. And uh, it's uh, nice to hear that uh, FDA has approved this uh, device for uh, certain uh, targeted cases of mitral regurgitation. Thank you so much. We have a senior uh, cardiothoracic surgeon, uh, Dr. Ashik, uh, who is uh, also a moderator here. I will uh, ask him to share uh, a few of his experiences in uh, treating this condition. Hello, Nish, the excellent presentation. Yes. Congrats. Thank you. Uh, the thing is, uh, is there any criteria for annular sizing for this uh, placement of uh, band or your micro clip? Because yeah, so sometimes, yeah. sometimes you get uh, only the uh, either the ventricle wall or the papillary muscle is at fault, and the annulus may be a dry, uh, size may be normal. And if you are going to clip it off, and later the patient may develop a mitral stenosis, is there any criteria for annular sizing? So uh, I'm not entirely sure of the detailed criteria for that, but I think your quality point is well taken. And uh, traditionally, what we understand uh, that, I mean, at least uh, that I've seen that people talk about is measuring the annular sizes. If the annulus is uh, smaller to begin with, even though the leaflets are very dysfunctional and pretty big and prolapsing leaflets, uh, grasping them with the mitra clip would potentially result in the mitral stenosis. So, but I have to look into it. I'm not entirely sure of the criteria. If there is yes, set. With my experience in rheumatic MRs, I have done an alphury and gone back and replaced the valve because right. uh, post -op, uh, coming up is difficult because the, uh, the annular size has come down and there is a significant MS. So, mitral stenosis is producing a problem. So, we have gone back and replaced with the valve. So, right. in, anyways, it's heavily, heavily, anyways, it's heavily calcified leaflets are a problem to begin with uh, in terms of clip placements and all that. How will you manage if you get a uh, tight mic? So as I said, like uh, I have seen like one case where like in the case itself, like after the clip, the uh, they use the X. There was a debate between using an XT versus an NT clip, and they somehow for whatever reason the Vina contractor was long, and they decided to use the XT. But putting an XT clip uh, again under anesthetized situation where the patient is usually more relaxed, the transvalvular gradients were approaching ten. And uh, the, the, everyone was worried that obviously when this patient wakes up, he's going to be short of breath from the mitral stenosis. It becomes a very challenging situation because once the, lift, uh, once the clips are kind of released and deployed and the catheter device system is removed, um, removing the clip is not simple, not easy. Uh, it probably would require surgical intervention. What about uh, after recovery, how will you manage? If you're putting a clip from MR, ischemic MR, the patient is recovers later with the, your uh, revascularization, and if the, if the mitral valve becomes tightened, how what is the plan? Like I mean, after the LV becomes again good, then if the mitral valve becomes tight, the, the annulus is uh, uh, narrowed now. What is the plan for that? I mean, I guess again, you have to monitor this patient closely. Echocardiographic parameters need to be monitored. Their transvalvular gradients should be definitely monitored, especially in the earlier time, every monthly basis. I see that people call them in their outpatient clinics on a monthly basis just to do a quick echo and to make sure that the mitral valvular gradients are not increasing and they have not done any harm. If they start noticing that the gradients are increasing, maximizing on the beta blockers is probably one way to grow. Obviously, you have to kind of manage that medically as much as possible. And if patients start developing symptoms, then surgical referral is the way to go there.
And one more thing is, how will you size these transcathetal bands for mitral diploma, mitral what? MR? Sizing the band, transcathetal mitral band you are putting, na? Yes. How will you size yes. the band for the patients? So again, it all depends on the annular sizing, I guess. They have to like very, uh, 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 they, have to they have to calculate the annular size and the bands, I think it, they are precise bands for the annular sizes. There are different precise bands which will fit certain, the, certain annular sizes. Uh, wraps are kind of like an integral component in this industry somehow. And a lot of times, and it's an unfortunate thing actually speaking, a lot of times like uh, uh, busy clinicians will have to rely on the calculations provided by the wraps. And what happens is all these pre-sized uh, bands, they're available for different sizes of annuluses. The wraps, they have special algorithms and uh, softwares that a lot of times the hospitals do not even have them at their end, uh, would be calculated by them, they'll be presented. Uh, there'll be someone in the hospital who would kind of try to corroborate with their findings um, and will come up with a common plan. So a wrap will come with a pretty, uh, like a size of the band for a given annular size and someone will be corroborating at the hospital. And if the size is kind of like come close to each other, they will agree with the plan and they'll proceed. That's what I was seeing. Yeah. Just during repair, we size the AML for sizing the ring. So the rings come with the size of the AML. Uh -huh. so, uh -huh. so we will be sizing the AML and putting the size uh, rings according to the size of the AML. So right. in ischemic MR, we have a ring specialized for uh, there is a uh, uh, special ischemic MR ring along which uh, uh, tucks the P2 segment and it helps in the reducing the size of the annulus. Right. So, uh, it's like after uh, after the FDA gave the approval for using MitraClip for functional MR patients and the billing became uh, like a green uh, go and, and the reimbursement wasn't an issue anymore. It looked like there, is, there are a lot of centers which are kind of catching up with the mitral MitraClip devices and therapies for the functional MR patients. And my worry is if you start putting MitraClip in all those functional MR patients without understanding that patients are adequately treated with the GDMT or not, and without understanding the proper imaging and structural imaging, you would cause more harm than benefit of these patients. And I, I'm not sure at the metro cities in India, how, how well scrutinized is this scenario. Thank you very much. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jignesh. I would uh, ask Dr. Pro Sankar Narayanan to uh, speak a few words and conclude. Sir, you are not audible, sir. Sir, regarding the septal puncture technique, sir, does it differ for different etiology? Or? Dr. Jignesh, uh, there is a question for you. So what was the question again? Septal puncture technique, sir. Yes. Does it differ for different etiology or is it same like we do for PTMC, sir? BMV. So no, the septal puncture device is basically like it's, it's incorporated into the delivery system itself. Basically, your wire advances and there is a delivery system uh, which just kind of follows the wire and it just uh, leads to the septum. So it's the same. It's all mounted on the catheter. It's all uh, part of the delivery system. And again, whatever small septal puncture remains behind, usually we kind of like try to assess the, uh, 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 how much is the how much is the gradient across the septum and uh, after the ASP, but they are always left behind. And on the follow-up echocardiogram, they are paid attention to uh, people do bubble study and make sure that uh, there is not an active communication. And most of the times, I've, I've, what we have seen is those septal puncture yield very well. No, she is asking, uh, is there any difference in so is it completely under uh, TE guidance or uh, do you go for fluoro also, sir? As you have shown us, it is fully of TE guidance. So, so when most part, that, uh, yeah. So I think it's TE guidance is uh, the primary guidance that we that we use. A lot of times there are operators who prefer the ice guidance as well. So they put a little ice probe. Uh, they took they take two uh, double venous punctures. So one venous puncture is for the delivery of the uh, mitra clip system. The other venous puncture is to deliver the uh, ice catheter. So they park their ice catheter up front. And then they, under the ice guidance, they, uh, they select their site of puncture of the APO center. So it's operator's preference. Either, so it's either ice guidance or the PE guidance. Usually. And of course, the floor would help you. Yeah, 
in case of lbbb with cure duration like more than 149 what would be your next approach sir? is it t crt or uh... Yes, yeah, again, like uh, optimizing the GDMP is the most important step before instituting any of these therapies. And one of the component is uh, to uh, make sure that the CRT was uh, given to the patient. Even in this, even in the COAP trial, they had made sure that the CRT was given to those patients who had LBBB. There were there were patients in the trial uh, who had LBBB with the duration of more than 140 millimeters, and uh, they would receive. So that that step should not be uh, uh, um, bypassed. So CRT if indicated in a right uh, uh, if there is a right indication for it, it should be instituted. Yes. Doctor Jignesh, how about any uh, uh, role of anticoagulation or any antiplatelet therapy after the clipping so procedure? Because so usually, like they put the, they keep the patient on the dual antiplatelets for one month. Uh, traditionally, that's what I've seen in the practice. If the patient is underlying atrial fibrillation, because a lot of these patients have so screening for atrial fibrillation is actually one of the very important things, because a lot of these functional MR patients with severe MR and all that with dilated left ventricular cavities, they inherently have dilated left atria. And uh, even though they do not have typically history of atrial fibrillation, uh, a lot of times I've seen that people uh, uh, people painstakingly look for any evidence of underlying paroxysmal aphids, uh, monitoring and rhythm monitoring and a good uh, assessment of the patient's symptoms are done to identify if there are any uh, uh, evidence of paroxysmal aphid or uh, any aphid episode. So then uh, anticoagulation could be managed accordingly and we do not, we do not miss that. Because if the patient has atrial fibrillation, uh, you have now a freshly put a clip in the system. It's going to take at least couple of uh, at least four to six weeks before a good endothelialization would start. So in that first one or two months, if the patient is in atrial fibrillation, there is uh, uh, it always like increases the risk of uh, thromboembolic events. So I think uh, assessing the patients upfront for uh, identifying any episode of paroxysmal, um, and if there is uh, if there is an atrial fibrillation involved, of course. Uh, um, appropriate use of anticoagulants is is always uh, a good thing. Thank you, Doctor Dignesh. I think uh, we are almost uh, out of questions, sir. Shankar, sir, is your audio problem corrected? We are still not able to hear you, sir. It's not a problem. Thank you, Dignesh. Uh, thank you for right. uh, spending your uh, whole week and uh, especially your weekend. For giving such a wonderful lecture and sparing time for all of us to learn uh, something which is new and uh, we had a wonderful discussion today morning uh, today is uh, monday for us and it's sunday evening for you thank you thank you thank you thanks a lot and uh, we would like to uh, see you in uh, many more meetings meetings in the future. thank you thank you so much for having me thank you everyone um, I'll, I'll, take you. Permission to, I'll take your permission to leave now thank you thank you thank you, thank you very much thank you bye Oh, yeah.